Welcome back to Senior English B, and today we are going to talk for a few moments about T.S. Eliot's poem, Wasteland. You should have a copy of the poem now in front of you. That, that, this poem does not appear in your anthology, but I am aware that I teach a lot of seniors who go on to college and university, and I want you to have some familiarity with this, what we called yesterday in our lecture, many argue, the greatest poem of the 20th century. Let's go ahead on another sheet of paper and write down that this is T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, 1922. Now, you will not be tested over this poem. Okay, not at the high school level. Not be tested over this poem. This experience for you is more about exposure to and experience of a really famous poem. But I am going to give you a few guiding principles to help you so that you have some sense of what you're looking at. On the copy of the poem that you have in front of you, do you notice the junk at the bottom? Go ahead, flip through pages and just see. Every page, do you see it? Junk at the bottom. Little tiny notes. Do you see that? There's a reason for that. When T.S. Eliot publishes this poem, he has to publish the poem with notes so that people who read the poem have some clue what all of his allusions are. Now this you'll want to write down again. Allusions. A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-S. Allusions. We used the term yesterday in reference to Holloman. Today we definitely use it in regards to Wasteland. An allusion is a reference to another literary text. Eliot will do this all the way through the Wasteland. Half the poem are lines from other works of literature. When the poem was published in 1922, people challenged Eliot by saying, Dude, half of your poem you didn't even write. His response and defense was, Good poets borrow, great poets steal. That is to say, I can make allusions to anyone that I want. Okay? Now, I want you to jot down at the top of your notes the words, What I need to know to understand this poem. What I need to know to understand this poem. It is a very learned poem, written by a very learned poet. I think I already told you, Eliot is a prodigy. He reads voraciously. He knows all kinds of literary texts, both in the field of literature, anthropology, psychology, sociology, and theology. In other words, he has a mind that, wa that goes a wide range. Here you can think about our comments regarding John Milton from earlier. He's read a lot, T.S. Eliot has. So when he sits down to write this poem, he calls on a lot of information from his prior knowledge. In some ways assuming that you, the reader, know all the stuff that he knows. Of course, how many readers are going to know all the stuff he knows? Ergo, the need for all the notes. Now, as we work through this poem for the very first time for you, I recommend pay no attention to the notes at all. Don't worry about it. All I'm asking you to do is to simply listen to a professional reading of this poem, okay? And I'm actually, if we have time, going to give you two professional readings of this poem. The first is, uh, re is read by a Harvard professor. Uh, I have not been able to find this recording other than the way I found it the one time I found it, and it was on an old... LP. Are you familiar with what I mean when I use the term LP? In the very olden days, the way you listened to music was what was called a long play record. In other words, it was a piece of vinyl with grooves in it. You literally put the, the record down onto it, it was called a record player, and you literally lifted up the arm of the record player and you set it, and there was a little needle, and you set it right down into the groove. You could actually hear, then through the speakers, you could actually hear the record turning. One of the problems with the LP was that if it ever got scratched, the needle would literally jump a groove. And so there would be part of the song or whatever that you just did not hear. This is a very old recording, and it's a recording from an LP. So as you listen, you're not going to be hearing it on LP. You'll be hearing it on tape. I made a tape of it. But you're not going to be able to hear at times so well. So you're going to have to follow along as you read. But as you read, okay, I want you to pay attention to the number of things that you would have to know to be able to understand this poem with any chance of survival. 
one of the reasons why we don't actually test it at the high school level. You just don't know enough. But you can know what you don't know in terms of generalities. And so that's kind of what we're looking at. All I'm asking you to do now is just read the poem, hear it read out loud by this professional Harvard prof. Now, when we finish with that, if we have time, I actually have the poem read out loud by T.S. Eliot himself. Before he died, he made some professional recordings of not only Wasteland, but several other poems. And I, and I will be able to let you hear, what does this cat, T.S. Eliot, actually sound like? All right? But first, your introduction for the first time for most of you to T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Here we go. Just follow along. That's all I'm asking you to do. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull woods with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us coming over the Sternbergerse with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the hot garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. In gar keine Russin, stammausch ich trauen, And when we were children staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on the sled and I was frightened. He said, Mari, Mari, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south of the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Oh, come in under the shadow of this red rock. And I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you, or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a hand. Frisch weht der Wind der Heimat zu, mein Erich Kind, wo oh, weinest du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They call me a hyacinth girl. Yet when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of night, the silence. Uh, there, Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyante, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wise pack of cards. Here, said she, is your card. Brown Phoenician silver, though as upturned as the fairy's eyes, look. Here is Bella Donna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man who please staves, and here the fields. And here is the one eyed merchant, and this car which is black. I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hand man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equator, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful in this field. 
another brown spot of a winter dawn. A crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnock kept the hours for the dead sound of the final stroke of night. There I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at my lead, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lector, ensemble, a game of chess. The chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble, where the glass held up by standard wrought with fruited vines, from which a golden tribidon peeped out, another hid his eyes behind the green, doubled the flames of seven branched candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it, from satin cases poured in rich profusion. In vials of ivory and colored glass, unstoppered, lurked her strange synthetic perfumes, unwound, powdered, or liquid, troubled, confused, and drowned the sense in odor. Stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended in patterning the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the lapping area, turning the pattern on the covered ceiling, huge seawood fed with copper, burnt green and orange, framed by the colored stone in which sad light a carved dolphin. Above the antique mantel was displayed, as though a window gave upon the silver sea, the change of Philomel by the barbarous king so rudely forced. Yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, and still she cried, and still the world pursues, junk, junk, to dirty things. And other withered stumps of were told upon the forms, staring forms being out, gloomy, rushing to the window. Footsteps shuffled up the stair. Under the firelight, under the brush, her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words. Then the savage listened. My nerves are bad tonight. Yes, bad. Stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking? What? I never know what you are thinking. Think. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? Wind under the door. What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember going up there on the of his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? Not. Oh, 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 that big picture in hand. It's so elegant, so intelligent. Yeah, what shall I do now? What shall I do? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. So, what shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water, ten. And if it rains, a closed car, four. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. When Leo's husband got demoted, I said, 
I didn't miss the words. I said to myself, Hurry up, please, it's time. Albert's coming back, and just Albert looks smart. He wants to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. He did, I was there. And you have them all out clear and get a nice set. He said, I swear, I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert, he's been in the army four years, he wants a good time. And if you don't give it to him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight hook. Hurry up, please, it's time. You don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so empty. And her opened the door. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It then feels like it to put it off, she said. She's had five already, and nearly died of the other one. Kemi said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What do you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please, it's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home. They had a hot gammon, and they asked me into dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night, Tata. Good night, good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. The fire sun. The river's tent is broken. The last fingers of leaf touch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles set with papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed. And their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors, departed, have left no addresses. By the water of the demon, I sat down. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back, in a cold blast, I hear the rattle of the bowl and chuckles spread from the earth to the earth. through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, using upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him. White bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low dry garret, rattled by the rat's foot only here to but at my back, from time to time, I hear the sound of horns and motors, which shall bring Sweeney to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter, and on her daughter, they washed their feet in soda water. Et oh, ces voix d'enfants chantant dans la Under the brown fog of a winter noon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currants, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing, waiting. 
I, Tiresias, go blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour that strides homeward, and brings the sailor home from sea, the typist home at tea time, clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the window, perilously spread, her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled, at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. He, the young man, Carbuncula, arrives. A small house agent's clerk, with one bold stare, one of the low, on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ending. She is poor and tired. Endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. I, who have sat by kings below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. The stone one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm dead, it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and faces about her room again alone, she smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gravel. This music crept by me upon the waters. And along the strand, up Queen Victoria Street, oh, city, city, I can sometimes hear, beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street, the pleasant whining of a mandolin, and a clatter and a chatter from within, where fishmen run at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold, inexplicable splendor, Ionian white and gold. The river sweats, oil and tar. The barges drift with the turning tide. Red sails, wide to the earth, swing on the heavy star. The barges wash, drifting on down the very street, past the iron guards. Why? Broken fingernails of dirty hands. 
by people, humble people, who expect nothing. To Carthage, then I came. Burning, burning, burning. is that sound high in the air, murmur of maternal lamentation? Who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth, ringed by the flat horizon only? What is the city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air, falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London, unreal. A woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings. A dance with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings 
and crawled head downward down the blackened wall, and upside down in air were colours, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours, and voices singing out of empty systems and exhausted wells. In this decayed hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves. About the chapel, there is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has more strength. Dry bones can harm no one. Only a cock stood on the roof. Coco, Rico, Coco, Rico, in a flash of lightning. Then a damp gust bringing rain. Ganja was sunken and the lit leaves waiting for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himala. The jungle crunched, humped in silence. Then out the thunder. Dark. Dark. What have we given? My friend. Blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment of surrender which an age of prudence can never regret. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. I have won. I have heard he turn in the door once. And turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison thinking of the key. Each confirms a prison only at nightfall. Imperial rumors revive for a moment a broken Coriolan. Da, da miata. The boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore fishing, with the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Boys as cause in their foco in the Athena, one no piano in Galina. Oh, swallow, swallow. Le prince d'Aquitaine à la tour abolie. These fragments I have shored against my ruin. Why then I'll fit you, Hieronymo's mad again. Data, Dayatva, Damyata. Shant. Shant. All right, welcome to the wasteland. Right away on the paper in front of you, just jot down your first observations about this poem in regards to what you just listened to and for a few of you even read. Go ahead, jot down one or two things, what you'd like to say right away. We'll come to this question about what do you need to know to be able to have any clue what this poem is about. Again, this is just an introduction to you, right? I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to ask you to somehow prepare for an exam or anything like that. By the way, 1922, when this poem is published, is a time in art when everything is quite experimental, we think of Picasso, don't we? Right? So jot down, what is experimental about this poem? How is this poem different from any poem you've ever read in your life? How do you see this as a different kind of poem than any poem you've ever read in your life? What are some of the things you need to know to have any, any clue of reading this poem. Uh, 
What would you say? Let's speak in generalities. What are some of the things that you need to know? How about it? Throw out one thing. You, you, it makes sense for you to know something for you to be able to have any chance at understanding this poem. What's one thing? Go ahead, take a stab at it. Time period. Say it again. Time period. You need to know history. Can we speak in generalities? You need to know history. It's going to help you if you have some sense of history. If you don't know history, beginning, of course, with the history of antiquity, the Greeks, the Romans, and then, of course, history up to 1922, you're going to have difficulty reading this poem with any chance of understanding. Good. Keep going. What else? What else do you need to know if you're going to read this poem? Yeah, let's just write that down. You're going to have to know a, a number of languages. You need to know German. You need to know French. You need to know Sanskrit. The last words of the play, Shanti, 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 come from the Upanishadic tradition. That's Sanskrit. Got to know, helps to know a little bit of Latin, a little bit of Greek. Nice to know Italian. You got, he, covers a lot of, he covers a lot of territory in regards to the languages, doesn't he? Good. Keep going. What else do you need to know? What else helps if you're, uh, if you're going to uh, somehow read this poem? Lots of other poems. Lots of other poems. Did you just even glance at all of the stuff that's in the notes? Lots of other poems. And let's go ahead and speak in, in larger terms. Lots of other literary texts. Can we just say it that way? Shakespeare's referenced all the time as Ophelia leaves to go out and drown herself. She says the words, good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night, good night. And of course, here, here they end up in this poem. Baudelaire's famous poem to the reader, you, hypocrite lecteur, mon sombre, mon frère. These, these are lines that just get thrown into this poem. The expectation is, A, you know Baudelaire, and B, you know your French. Again, you don't have any clue to the, lecture, to, to the uh, relationship or allusions to the literature. It's kind of like lost to you. We could keep going. How about this? You need to know all your religious texts. Probably makes sense to know the Bible. Makes sense to know the Vedic traditions and so on and so on and so on. There is a, in other words, there's a wealth of things that you really need to know if you're going to have much of a chance of understanding a poem like this. Now, what does this poem say? or me. Well, I can help you because I said to you yesterday, what did I say about this poem? What is the cliff notes to this poem? Do you remember what I said? What is the cliff notes for this poem? What is the poem that you read to help you understand this poem? The hollow men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Our last are dry voices when we whisper together, quiet and, what's the word? Do you remember it? Quiet and meaningless. And that's a good word. Listen to the title. What's the title of the poem? Wasteland. Oh, that's a happy sounding title. Right. Do you get me? So all the way through the poem, you're going to have these references to positive or negative kinds of experiences. Yeah, lots of negative experiences, huh? So that by the time you get to the Buddhist fire sermon, a burning, 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 O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out, O oh Lord, thou pluckest. By the time you get there, it's pretty clear that T.S. Eliot is making a pretty harsh criticism of his own modern culture. Now, to prove to you that he didn't die a bitter old man, we will look at next his four quartets, four poems that he wrote before he died, which have a tremendous amount of optimism to them. And in fact, some of my seniors will say these are some of the coolest lines that we'll read all year long. They really like these poems uh, that we'll look at starting tomorrow. Before we finish today, though, go back to the beginning of Wasteland. And here you go. This is the voice of the greatest poet of the 20th century reading the poem Wasteland. We'll only listen to a few lines here. Go ahead, watch it. This is the voice of the great T.S. Eliot himself.
Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Starnbergersee with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the hot garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Pinkar keine Russin, stamm aus Litauen, echt Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archdukes, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats. And the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock, Come in under the shadow of this red rock and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch weht der Wind, der Heimat zu. Mein Irish Kind, wo weilest du? You gave me her since first a year ago. They called me the Hyacinth Girl. Yet, when we came back late from the Hyacinth Garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence, who don't live thus near. Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here, said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. Those are pearls that wear his eyes. Look. Here is Belladonna, the lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is a man with three staves, and here the wheel, and here is the one-eyed merchant, and this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, shall I bring the horoscope myself? One must be so careful these days. All right, so there you go. An introduction to T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. All right, thank you.